It just reminds me of, uh, that song reminds me of the statement in Hebrews, without holiness, no one will ever see God. Uh, and the wonder of our God is, is that he stepped into the world to make us holy uh, by giving up um, our sin, turning our backs uh, on the way we used to be by his grace uh, so that he could make us, as Paul likes to call us, as holy ones, saints, uh, and make us his own so that we can be with him. Uh, well, I want to uh, just encourage you to take your Bibles out if you have them, whether you got them electronically or physically here, and open them to the book of Titus. Uh, we're beginning a new series today. Uh, there's a couple of things, though, that I, that I want to take care of before we get there. Um, uh, did any of you get a chance to go out to the little street festival in Xenia on Friday? How many of you got to go out to do that? Okay, a bunch of you did that. Did, did, how many of you saw, you know, Pastor Van, the game master? Did anybody see him out there? Yeah, he was, he should wear his outfit there. He had a bandana on it around his head, like a thing like they looked like he was a, a, a hippie refugee while he was out there, but, but he was having a great time. It's Van was animated running the games and had a bunch of good helpers out there. I saw Ryan Samuelson, uh, Janelle, uh, Ryan Boudreaux, who was here, and I'm missing some, but I saw a bunch of people out there helping, so that was a great opportunity, a lot of fun uh, for people out there. And I hope you take advantage of those as a church uh, to go out and meet people and be a part of our community uh, and let the Lord use us uh, to be salt and light where we are, so it was a great opportunity. Second thing, I think Drew has something that he wanted to announce today, uh, that, he, that something happened to him recently uh, that he wanted to let us know about. Drew, what happened? here recently? Uh, Morgan and him got engaged. Uh, Morgan and him got engaged. All right. So I'm ha happy to have uh, Morgan and Drew. That's a good couple. Uh, also, uh, Tyler and Deb are here. And I, is this the first time you've been here since you've been back as a married couple, or am I missing that? All right. Well, they're, they're newly minted, a newly minted married couple. So we're we're glad to have them here. They're not ready to write their uh, seven keys to a successful marriage book yet, but uh, give them another week and they'll be ready uh, to do that. But we're so glad to have them with us. And also today, the Freeds are back with us. They come, except for Ryan. Ryan is not here with us, but Chris is here and the kids are spread around in different places here. Uh, so we're so glad to see them. We miss them, but we pray for them as they've relocated to the sunny climate of Minnesota. Uh, to be there because they love the winters in Minnesota. Well, they're going to be winter people here soon, so nothing about that. All right, well, let's look at uh, Titus chapter uh, 1. One of the things that we just titled this little series, as you see it there, A Healthy Church, and the title comes from the idea that Paul is telling Titus to teach sound teaching. He uses the term, the town, term t sound teaching, teach them what's sound for them. And they, an, a way to think about that term, it's often used in the arena of being healthy, teach things that make people healthy, spiritually healthy, right? The sound teaching. And so when we're looking at this little letter, it's only three uh, short chapters, but we're looking at Paul writing one of his protégés, Titus, that has been sent out on mission to this little island in the middle of the Mediterranean. Uh, not a very big island, right? Galen was giving me the, the geographical dimensions, not very long, 160 some miles long out in the middle. It was uh, an island that had a terrible reputation in the ancient world. Uh, that was uh, a reputation not given to it by Christians, it was given it to it by the other people from the Greco-Roman world. And matter of fact, Paul will quote one of their own poets who describes the Cretans, uh, and it's a very derogatory description, but I guess as being one of their own, he's able to say it. And he says that they're renowned for being liars. The Cretans were renowned because they were an island uh, uh, group of people, and basically uh, they made their, their li livelihood by the shipping trade which came to them up on their shores. Uh, they were not known for producing anything, but they were a necessary waypoint for people to travel the Mediterranean because you could not, in the ancient world, you couldn't travel across the Mediterranean. You had to skip along the coast or go to an island to get provisions and things like that because the shipping was just not capable of doing long, uh, open uh, ocean sailing. And so Crete literally had its commerce you know, float up to its shores. 
uh, and in Crete, you had a good reputation, you were highly valued in your community, is, is, is if you could succeed in getting the most money out of the people who came through your port, right? Uh, if you think of the old analogy of coming across a gasoline station in the middle of the desert and it says, you know, gas, three, $30 a gallon. Next gas station, you know, 300 miles, right? Something like that, right? That's exactly what Crete was. And so you actually were honored in Crete if you were a good liar that you could take people for a lot of money. So that was well known. The second thing is that they were known for being lazy. As I mentioned, they didn't produce anything on their own. Uh, they basically just handled material as it came in and out of their port. Uh, they were not known for people of producing any great architecture or works or anything along those lines. And so they had a reputation for being lazy people uh, who were gifted geographically with a necessary waypoint and they didn't produce anything. And the final thing, which is the darkest one, and there's been a good bit of research to go into this, that there was a sexually depraved culture. So Paul says that they were liars and they were uh, lazy people and he says that they behaved like animals, right? And he quotes uh, one of their poets. This is why when Titus is sent here, uh, he comes and either Paul had done some initial missionary work with Titus or Paul arrived on Crete and found out that there was just a small handful of Christians that hadn't been organized into a church, but he sends Titus there to put things in order. And so as you're reading right at the beginning, he says in verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint leaders. So this is a church that there's a group of little believers here. They're in a culture that is, is really morally impoverished, it's really depraved. And so Paul prepares Titus for the fact that he's got a bunch of new believers, babies, and he's in a culture that is really dark. And so Titus is going to have to be prepared to do some really hard work. And he says, sometimes, Titus, you're going to really have to uh, really address them and deal with them very upfront and deal with them very sharply, he says, right? So sometimes you're going to have to deal with some very dark situations. So in the midst of this, we get, a, we get an idea from Paul about the necessary ingredients in a healthy church. Well, what do you need to have in a church that's healthy, a church that where the things that have been unfinished are finished, right? And you get them put together so that the church can be the church. You know, when you're, you're thinking about physical health, right, which uh, all of us are at different times, we think about physical health, one of the things to determine whether a person is healthy or not is you need to know what a healthy person actually is. So, for example, we know a healthy person, their temperature is usually what? 98.6. So if you're taking somebody's temperature and it's 103, you know something's wrong, right? You don't go, great, well, you're really hot today, right? Nobody says that. Uh, you go, no, you're sick. We need to do something about this, right? So, but you have to have a baseline, the same thing. Right? If uh, somebody comes to you and tells you that the, they're seeing dinosaurs walking around out in the parking lot, you know, you, you think, well, that's not a healthy functioning mind, right? A healthy functioning mind doesn't see things that are not there. So either one, we think that the person is just joking with us, right? There's dinosaurs out there and they're playing a joke, or they're a liar, right? They're saying things that aren't true, or we call it they're hallucinating. Something is going on because there's no dinosaurs out in the parking lot, even if they say so, right? So those are the kind of things, but we have to have a baseline of what's healthy. Well, here we're going to use Titus to help us get a baseline for what is healthy. What does it mean to be healthy? So I thought here, whoops, maybe I should turn this on. That might help us to move forward. Here, all right. So the idea, we're going to talk about a checkup, right, for the church, right? So if the church is unhealthy, right, what would a doctor look for? And we're going to use Paul's prescription to try to go after it. Right? Now, this is, this is important for a number of reasons because what we want to check here, not only we want to ask, is our church healthy, which is always a good question to ask, but we also want to ask, if you think the church is unhealthy, if I or an individual within the church think the church is unhealthy, are we using God's scale or are we using another scale? Because there's a lot of people that think that church should be a certain thing if it's healthy, right? Some people think, for example, it should be all about me. When I walk in to a church, it should be focused on me. Everything should be relevant to me. It should be all about me. And the question is, is that really the standard that constitutes a healthy church? 
Should you walk into a church and find out that, for example, that even though you're in your 30s or you're in your 20s or you're in your 50s, that matter of fact, everything that's said up front doesn't relate to you directly. Sometimes it relates to people who aren't in your age and stage. Is that a healthy church? Should it be the fact that at some point in time when you walk into a church that you find the fact that you're not the center of attention and should you be concerned about that? If you're never addressed, that's a concern. But if you're not the constant center of attention, maybe that's the wrong standard that you're looking for, right? So this is important for us not only to evaluate ourselves as a church, it's important to evaluate ourselves as individuals when we evaluate the church, right? Because one of the things that we have the luxury of in America, which is also to the detriment of us, is that in many places today, right? I just met with one of my missionary friends for breakfast this, uh, this past week. And he's working in a pastor training area in Philippines. And in the Philippines, the majority of the pastors that they were training were pastors who were coming out of China to come to this seminary to be trained to go back and minister in China. Well, now the government has so cracked down on the church in China that the, the feeder schools that these, these men were coming from and women were coming from have all been closed down. Uh, many people have been imprisoned. Um, many people have, uh, have turned to social uh, apps, little apps where they can connect with each other and they're meeting at random times because they don't want to be discovered by the government. Uh, if they do have an organized church, the government now is forcing them to put right up in the front. If we were here and we were in China today, there would be hanging from the front of our auditorium video cameras so that everyone in this auditorium could be seen and recognized as being a part of this church by the government. Well, you can imagine how that affects people attending and the implications that are there for that and especially for bringing somebody in who doesn't know Jesus. So where we are in the moment, but where we are in the United States, given still the crazy environment that we're in, what often happens in America, as soon as we evaluate a church and figure out it's not what we want, we just go down the street to the one next door. When you're in China, not so easy. When you're in South Korea, North Korea, not so easy, right? Those kinds of things. And so here in America, we have the propensity right, to use tools to evaluate that we want to make sure that they're biblical tools as we look at them. And so this is what we want to do as we look at uh, uh, the book of Titus. So here's some of the things that he's going to address. And I'm, he, I'm not saying that these are all the things that constitute a healthy church. This is just Paul in the book of Titus telling us that these things are the kinds of things that you should find in a healthy church. And so I'll give you some of them and I'll come back to those questions here and let you fill in some blanks in your notes. So he's going to talk about, well, what should be the governing authority over your church? We'll kind of come back to that one, right? About who should lead the church, about the kind of life the church should have in its relationships with each other, about how we are connected to people outside the church, what our motivations are, and what kind of witness do we have, and about the response of the church when we meet challenges to our identity and mission, right? So I'll put it this way in this list here. If Paul were coming, he might ask these questions, right, to evaluate whether we're a healthy church or not. So one of them is, what is the governing authority in your church? And this is the thing is, who tells us who we are and what we're supposed to be and do, right? Who's the authority that does that? Where do we look to to try to tell us, well, what is the church? And what does it mean to be the church? What does it mean for me to follow Jesus? What, what are those uh, what are those that the church believes are qualified to leave? Who are those people, right? Who should be in the leadership of the church and what kind of people should they be, right? So Paul's going to spend this very first thing he's going to talk about who should lead the church because they need leaders, number one, and they need a particular kind of leader, right? And then third, what kind of relationships do you see within the church? When we get into chapter two, he's going to talk about the church as a family, which is interesting to begin, right? So the church isn't a lecture hall, it isn't a club, it isn't uh, a, a place where I come to get resources for myself or my family, right, apart from a relationship. If I'm a part of a family, it means I have obligations to other people and I see myself differently. So he's going to talk to the various segments of the community and he's going to call 
the older women as if they're they're, uh, moms in the faith and older men as if they're dads in the faith and young men and young women and how they're supposed to respond and live in relationship to each other. Well, that's a different way of thinking about it. If you're part of a family, right, we all know the difference between being family and just being acquaintances. If something happens in your family, you've got obligations. You need to meet those obligations, right? So in my own home, I don't have an obligation to take care of people that aren't a part of my family, right? So when when my girls were growing up, I wasn't worried about paying the bills in the households of their friends. But I was concerned about paying the bills in our household. I was concerned about the welfare and the health of my girls, but I wasn't concerned as in the same way about their friends, right? So that was their mom and dad's responsibility. But if you think about the church as a family, right, then I have responsibilities to Will that are different than just a mere acquaintance. He's my brother. Dorcas is my sister, right? Larry, Larry even is my brother, right? So those are responsibilities. Well, that's a different sort of idea. Then how does the church family relate to people outside the church? That's a, that's a big question. What, what kind of reputation do we have and how do we see our relationship to people outside the church? In chapter three, he's going to talk a whole lot about what should be our motivations. How should we, how should we view people outside the church? How should we be engaged with them? Do we have a responsibility toward them at all? And Paul's going to say, yes, we do, a huge one. Right? He's going to anchor it. And then what does the church do when it's under threat? How does the church respond, right? And so he's going to end the book with talking about certain people who are attacking the church and what the church is supposed to do to respond to it, right? So a healthy church has a particular set of leaders, has has a uh, governing authority that is, we're going to talk about here, is going to be scripture, that the relationships you see, you're going to see a family, and then We're going to see a church that's burdened for those outside as people who know the sting of sin, who know the reality of what it means to be outside of Christ, and who have empathy and love people unconditionally just as they were loved by God. And then we're going to find a church that is going to be serious about protecting its mission and its identity on the inside. Now, if you'll just join me, would you mind just standing, and we're going to read together Titus 1, 1 to 4. This is just the opening section of the little book of Titus. I want to read this together. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. May the Lord add his blessing in the reading of his word. You can be seated. All right, so let's just begin right here at the beginning. The first thing that I want to point out is if you're looking here, Paul gives his credentials. Look in verse 1, Paul, a servant of God. This is a title that Paul uses for himself that has a long history in the Scriptures. It's used for Moses, it's used for David, it's used for Elijah. And, And to be a servant of God means to be someone who's been set apart by God for a specific role, right? A specific role. But but he's a servant, he's to do God's bidding. So a servant of God, and then when he talks about himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, that is the particular role that Paul is going to serve God in by being a servant of Jesus Christ. To be a servant is to be someone who's appointed by Christ, sent out by Christ on a mission. Well, what is the mission that he's appointed to, right? To further the faith among God's elect. So here, Paul's job, he's been tasked by God through Jesus Christ to go proclaim a message about what God has done in Christ so that those people that God is bringing to himself will come to them. Paul is God's means to bring the ones that God is saving to himself. And that's Paul's job, and to grow them in their faith. That's his mission, okay? So the issue here is when it comes to Paul's marching orders, his, his idea of who he is and therefore everything that he's going to teach about the church, what Paul is saying is, I'm speaking to Titus 
I'm speaking to Titus on behalf of God as sent out by Jesus Christ so that I'm giving instructions from the authority of who stands over the church, right? So the person who's telling Paul about what he's supposed to be doing and therefore what he's passing on to Titus is God. And so the very first thing here to talk about what we're here is, is a simply one that we can't get past. I want to say the governing authority in your church, a healthy church is rooted in the truth that comes to us from God through his authorized representatives, the prophets and the apostles, right? That is the scriptures. The reason why, right, we consult this book is because it's God's words that have come to us through his authorized agents. And it's important, the ones that God himself has spoken through, the ones that he's inspired and have been recognized by the people of God to be his spokesman, that is our authority because it's God's word. So God is our ultimate authority. We turn to this, we let it tell us who we are, we let us tell us what we should be about, right? And to correct us when we get off the path. This is what we were talking about in 2 Timothy, right? The scriptures are profitable, they're good, because they lead us to Christ in salvation and they lead us to live out our life in relationship with him. So why, how do they do this? They teach us, they tell us who we are. They tell us that we're people who were broken and separated from God and rebels and we needed to acknowledge that and then call out to him to deliver us. And then it teaches us that we're dependent upon him and we're his children, we've been adopted into his family, right? He set his love and favor on us and he's growing us into our new identity. And one day he's going to come back and fulfill everything he's promised. That's who we are. It tells us that, right? So it tells, it teaches us that. And then when we lose our minds, it rebukes us, right? When we get caught up in a wrong story and somebody tells you, no, 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 you're not, you're not a child of God. No, 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 you're not valuable because you don't look this way or you don't have money or you don't have a position of authority. No, this comes back and rebukes us and says that's a lie. And then it corrects us back into the path of life so that it trains us to live a life of righteousness, right? So that's our authority, and it's the key thing that's going to structure our life. And we're going to come back to this because it's important. God's word not only tells us who we are and what we're about, but it tells us what's important and what isn't. And it also orders the important things in a particular order. You know, I don't know what, what your plans are today, but your primary responsibility today, the most important thing you can do today is connect with God in your day. If you don't know him, you're missing out on life altogether. If you do know him, more than preparing for the picnic this afternoon, more than getting everybody dressed, more than everything else, you need to get oriented toward him before you do anything. That's the most important thing you need every day. And if you're a mom in the home and you've got little kids, you know that by the time you've lost your mind at like an hour later, right? You know that you need help for the simplest things of life because that's who you are and what you need is a connection with him, right? You need to call out to him in the midst of those frustrating moments, right? You need to have, bring him in. Being. One of the things I've learned about myself that I have to do, I have this terrible thing where the evil one just wants me to kind of go on autopilot and forget the fact that God is ruling and reigning and I'm living in his presence. And so sometimes I have to talk out loud. If you would have seen me in my a car yesterday when I was by myself yesterday morning, I was talking out loud in the car. And I said, God, I just need to be reminded that you're here and you're present today. I need to be reminded that I'm your son. I need to be reminded that you're in, you're in uh, control today. And Lord, I want you to put a guard over my lips today that I don't say anything that I'm going to regret and hurt other people. And I have to openly bring him in. When I'm sitting at my desk and I start to study, I, I pray out loud and ask him, Lord, I need you to redeem this space because I'm going to get distracted. I'm going to get uh, enticed to go different directions. God, please help me to stay focused right here, right? So a healthy church recognizes what authority is the authority. And this is a big question today. Who tells you about yourself as a human being? Who tells you who you are and what you should be doing? Who tells you what's important? And I'll tell you, there are a lot of voices that are trying to tell you all those things. We'll come back to that. Well, the second thing about a church here, right? So let me, so first, before I get there, I just want to say this about the idea. The Bible reminds us of who we are and what we're up to, and it keeps us from getting hijacked onto somebody else's priorities. Now, I deliberately told you that the most important thing today for you is to check your relationship with God and connect to Him. 
that's more important than the sexual craziness in our culture. That's more important than race and race issues. That's more important than politics. That's more important than your job. That's more important than the way your lawn looks. All those, that's more important. And the culture wants to tell you as soon as you get up and you put your phone on or you turn on whatever your device is, it wants to lay out for you what's the most important thing that you should think about today. And what the most important person that you need to think about today is God and his will on your life so that you don't get hijacked by somebody else's program. And when you do confront the problems, that you approach them from his perspective, right? So what's the most important identity marker for everyone in this room? It's not whether you're black or white. It's not whether you're Asian. It's not whether anything. It's whether or not you know God or you don't. That's the most important thing about you. And you should be most concerned about that when you meet someone. There's a lot of other identity markers that characterize us that we, we can figure out as we get to know each other. But one of the things that we, we know is that the only thing that really matters in the end is what have you done with Jesus Christ? And I want to know that about the people that are here. And if I'm more concerned about the other issues, somebody else is determining what I think is most important. It's not most important whether you're Republican or Democrat. It's not most important whether you voted for Biden or not. That's not most important. What's most important is do you know Jesus or not? And am I living toward you to commend Jesus to you, to encourage you to follow him? That's the most important thing, right? So the Bible's going to structure that. So they live out the story of God's saving work in Christ. They're always engaged in a project of becoming and being God's people in this time in between the times. What are the times? Christ's first coming and second coming, right? We're waiting for Christ to come. And this is where Paul's going to say, we're waiting, right, for the promise to be fulfilled. So that's the first thing. We know who our authority is, and we're letting him set our agenda about what's most important today, okay? And so I, I say this on the other level, in your marriage, what's most important today for you as a husband is to get in touch with Jesus and follow Jesus. The most important thing is not to get your wife in order. The most important thing is to you to get your heart right before the Lord so that you can be the kind of man that you need to be toward your wife. Right? The only person that you're accountable before, before the Lord is for you. And so you can, you can love Christ and live toward your wife in a way that honors him. What's going to happen between your wife and you and your wife and Jesus, that's up to her. But at the end of the day, you want to represent Christ and, and live toward her in a way that honors him and vice versa for the wife. Same thing for your kids. You can represent Jesus, love them. You can own your failings. You can, you can be kind and generous. You can discipline in the ways you want to. But at the end of the day, you have to turn them over to the Lord to change their hearts. But the most important for thing for you as a parent today is to walk with Jesus so you can look like him and represent him to your kids. Okay? Not for your kids to obey. That's not the most important thing. Not for them to stop being annoying. That's not the most important thing. Not for them to leave you alone. Not for them to give you five minutes peace. The most important thing for you is to follow Jesus and reflect him today. Right? And we forget that because the world wants to tell us, if my kids would just stop doing that, if my husband would just do this, if my boss would stop doing that, if, if we could just get different leadership in our government, if we could do that, then our lives would be put together. Now, what, what Scripture tells us, no, no, you need to walk with Jesus today, and if you walk with him, everything else to go, can go to hell in a handbasket, and your life is okay. And that's the best you can do, right? So key thing, right, first one. Second one, what is the governing authority? A healthy church responds to the challenges of their moment by drawing on the particular gospel truths that speak to those challenges. Now, what I want you to look at, look at verse 2 here in this little opening, it's, what's interesting here is that the emphasis, Paul speaks about a particular truth that falls within the broader truths that constitute the good news, right? The good news is, is God's story of what the Father has planned about what Christ did in his work on the cross and in the resurrection from the tomb and about what the Holy Spirit makes effective in the lives of each individual. That's the good news of what God is doing to re re restore and reclaim everything. Well, inside that big story are all kinds of important truths that we need to know about how to live into that story. There are certain truths we need to know in order to be a person who's saved or delivered. We need to know that Christ died for me, that I'm a rebel, I'm a sinner, and that I can't save myself, and that I, I just need to cast myself and say, God, do for me what I can't do. And God says, I will save you. 
I'll make you my own. We need to know that truth. But also when we come to Christ, we need to know that when he saves us, when he gives us eternal life, a quality of life in relationship with him, we don't get everything that he promises us at the point of salvation. We're waiting for Christ to return to get the fullness of the promise. So we're all people who believe on the promises fulfilled in Jesus. And because we do, we believe that his future promises will be fulfilled. And so we're people of promise. The reason why I endure, I can face death and difficulties with confidence is knowing that Christ is taking the thing that really threatens me out of my future. What is the thing that that I have no control over? Death. Well, who's going to deliver me from death? Well, another human being, and I certainly can't do it myself. Well, who's going to deliver me? The person who conquered death, Jesus. He says, if you believe on me, my resurrection will become yours. And so we, we have a promise of the fulfillment of everything. And it's important to know that, that you haven't arrived yet. But that's an important gospel truth that Paul's going to emphasize because he's got false teachers who are denying that the promise is out in front of them and are teaching that they have everything that God promises now. And they're messing up the lives of people. No, we're people who are waiting for everything. This is why every day for a Christian, you can be content in Christ but you'll never be ultimately fulfilled this side of heaven because you'll never get everything that you're truly created for until you see Jesus. That's why you'll see Christians characterized as people who yearn for Christ's coming. Well, people who yearn for Christ's coming are looking forward to something that they presently don't have. They're eagerly anticipating it. This is why no matter how great your 4th of July picnic will be today, no matter how epic, right, your celebration will be, at the end of the day, it will end, right? And it won't be the party that will end all parties. That's why every Christmas we build with anticipation. It's sweet, but it never ultimately fulfills. That's why if you try to burden a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend with all of your happiness, you'll just crush them under the weight of your expectations and you'll ultimately be disappointed because they can't fulfill what only Christ can fulfill when he returns. So today, every day, I'm still looking for the fulfillment of everything Christ has promised me, right? Because as a believer, if this is everything that God has promised you, it's pretty disappointing, right? I was uh, was talking with Shelly on on Friday, and Shelly's got a back that she's looking forward to getting healed one of these days, right? And the difficulties that you have through life, some physical struggles, right, emotional, mental struggles, struggles with people who bring things into your life. This is a part of a fallen world. We're waiting for the realization of everything and we're declaring to people that the king came, he made a way into the kingdom and he's going to come back as judge. So please come under his rule now before you lose your opportunity. Right? So we live as people of promise. So particular gospel truths. Now, so here we're always asking, right, as a church, We're always, as pastors, we're not only studying God's word, but we're studying God's word over against what's going on in your lives, in our lives, right? Paul's letter to Titus is applying the scriptures or God's truth to a particular moment. So what are the kinds of things we're asking here? So Paul is emphasizing the future promise because people were getting that messed up who are false teachers. So he emphasizes it. Well, what are the kind of truths at time that we need to emphasize given what's going on in our culture? All right, these are kind of things. So we ask, what elements of God's saving work in Christ by the Spirit especially speak to our moment? All right? What elements are being challenged? How are they being challenged? What are the things that, that, that are trying to reform your identity and make you think of yourself something that you're not as a follower of Jesus? What are things that we're encouraged to make a priority that we really shouldn't make a priority as God's people, right? What is happening or could happen to our church if these truths are neglected or distorted, right? So we're thinking about that. One of the things just off the cuff here, it's just an easy one, is if you think of yourself when you walk in the church as a consumer, as somebody who's here to consume a product like somebody shopping in a religious mall, right? If that's how you view yourself, well, then you come in and evaluate the church based on whether or not they offered a good product to you. But if you walk into the church and you think of yourself as a family member, 
right? A family member is a producer. They're a part of the family. They're coming in with gifts and a responsibility to do something. They don't look at the church and say, well, who's going to meet my needs? They go, well, if our church is not meeting people's needs according to the way God calls us to, what do I do to help it? Because it's my family. That's a very different view. And the culture is trying to teach us, well, no, you're a primarily a consumer and your job is just to give a Yelp review when you're done. That's your job to do that. Well, that's not who we are as the family of God. Okay? Now, let me give you a couple things here that are, are things that are here. And I'm not going to go in all of them because there are too many. I just listed some that I think are some major challenges of our moment. And I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of them. We're, we're in a moment where in my own lifetime and in the history of the West in particular, this term here, there's no sacred order. And what I mean by that, this is a term that's fallen on bad times in this present moment. It's a term, uh, it's called hierarchy, right? The original use of that term, higher, has to do holy. Archy has to do with an old order of things. And the way it's used in the tradition of the church is that it's really important to know that the world is ordered in a particular way. Number one, that God is at the top of the order. <laughs> He's the creator and the sustainer of everything that exists. And matter of fact, if you don't recognize that he's at the top of the heap, then you get life wrong. And then this God who's at the top of the heap, you can relate to him through Jesus Christ. There's a holy order of things. But if you think that there's no God, if you think there's no designer, if you think that you're just left on your own, well, that creates a very different way of being as a human being. Well, the whole idea that there's a God who's set an order in plate and given us assignments as human beings about who we are and what we're to be, that whole thing is being swept away, okay? And it fits into the next one here. Human beings are accidents. There's no design and no purpose, right? If there's no holy order of things, if, if God doesn't exist and he hasn't designed anything, well, then human beings are accidents, right? They're, they're just interesting meatballs, right? They've come into existence there's no reason for them. There's no design behind them. And so the idea here is that you're just raw material and you get to make it up as you go. Well, what do you look to to make yourself up? Well, normally it's people say, well, you just turn to your strongest desire. What's your strongest desire? We'll tell you who you are, right? Now, this at, a, at an earlier time was more kind of benign. It's like the old Disney line, right? The Disney line, the hero in every Disney story, when they get their head on right, what do they do? They listen to their heart. If you just listen to your heart, it'll tell you who you are, right? And so now we live in a place where your biology doesn't tell you who you are. Your parents can't help you figure out who you are, right? Matter of fact, they may do something damaging like tell you you were a boy when you were born, right? So your biology can't tell you who you are. The adults in your life can't tell you who you are. There's no institutions that can tell you who you are, like churches or government agencies. The only thing that we can do is just tell you that, well, I guess we can say you're a being of some sort, maybe not even human being, or you're a being, and then we just let you try to figure out who you are, and then it's driven by the strongest desire you have. And for many people, right, and we know this in human existence, one of their strongest desires is sexual desire. So you are what you desire sexually, and that becomes your major identity. Or, on the other hand, look at your skin. That'll tell you who you are, and you should be a certain person because you have a certain skin. Right? So where we are at the moment, these are challenges that come that affect our church. It affects the way we think about ourselves. You guys live in a world every day where people are telling you that you need to listen to your heart and do what you think is best for yourself. You're living in a place where people are telling you that, that you're a hater and a bigoted if you think that there's only men and women. You're living in a place where, right, the idea that you to be a friend to somebody that you love, if they come up and tell you that they're bisexual, demisexual, pansexual, whatever sexual, that your job is just to say, okay, great, I'm glad you figured out who you are. And because I love you, I want to affirm that and just help you to be whatever you are. Is that really to love a person, Right? All those kinds of things that we're in right now, and it's affecting the way we talk. And over this last, and again, some things are always good, but over these last 20 years, the, the, as, as a pastor, right, when I get up here and I know I'm out on YouTube, 
and I know I'm on these different places, I think very carefully about the words I use to describe things, to even use biblical words to describe them. Even to say that it's God's design, it's the holy order of things, that he designed the family to be a man and a woman in a lifetime relationship is a hateful statement in our culture because it denies the goodness of every other family type. But I want to tell you that the holy order that Scripture says is a man and woman in a relationship with one another, not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman, not a group of people, not a, a collection of people who happen to live in a home, but a man and a woman covenanted together in marriage and that they steward their children under God, right? That is God's design for the family, right? That's the design for the family. That's, if I believe that God has created us and that's his benevolent design, if I love you as a pastor, I'm going to encourage you toward that model. It's not good for you to live with somebody and just shack up with somebody. It's not good to ch hop around. It's not good to encourage one another to immediately give up on your marriage because things have gotten hard. That's not God's design. It's not all about the easiest path to take or what you feel is right. We're often trusting God to do what's good and right, and we're trusting him by faith when it seems difficult. So those are the kind of ideas here, right? And I could go into many of these things and, and talk about them, but we don't have time today. Now, so here, just a quick checkup as we come to the conclusion of this and, and look at our communion. Do we as individuals and as a church have the right perspective on who should be the governing authority in our lives? Do we recognize and submit to God's authority? Now, I want to say this about all of us. One of the reasons why we're here, the answer to this is probably yes and no. Right? And it's yes and no in the sense that, one, you're here this morning, and for whatever reason, you, you want to be here because... Uh, something about what God says you want to pay attention to or the people around you that have invited you here, you've seen something in them that's attracted you and you want to be here and you want to be around them. Well, that's a good thing. You're recognizing to a certain extent that God has done something gracious in the life of somebody else and you want to come and be a part of that. You want to participate in it, right? So the answer is yes and no. But for all of us, we know that this week, right, if we're honest with ourselves, were moments where we thought we knew better than God. And it showed up in what we saw on our computers. It showed up in how we behaved toward our spouses. It showed up in the way we treated our parents. It showed up in the way we neglected or loved or did uh, loved our neighbors. It showed up in all those different things. The way we viewed ourselves when we clicked on that social app and we saw that picture of those other girls who seemed to have everything that you wish you had about what happened in your mind when you looked at that picture about whether you reaffirmed your identity in Christ or you got upset with God that he didn't give you the same package. All those things are about who we let be the authority in our life. Who tells us what's important? Who sets our agenda for the day, right? And one thing I can tell for all of us, right? The people that are the authorities that you trust, you invite them regularly to tell you who you are and what you should do. And for all of us, right, we can drift along through the day. And here's one thing I know about myself, right? My wife can tell you this. She'll testify to it with, with sadness and a little bit of irritation. Greg will consult his phone every day. Every day I will consult my phone, right? And it'd be interesting if we just had a moment of transparency here where all of us looked at our most frequently visited sites that we have on our phones. Okay, where would they be? News sites, Bible app right? Sports sites, what would they be? And the question is, the people that we consult the most are the ones that we're letting tell us who we are and what we should be doing the most. What's most important, right? So the question here for us as a church as we look through this, are we really letting the Bible, and you know where the Bible's authority really comes to bear? Is when it cuts across the cultural grain and cuts across our own fears and anxieties that's where the rubber meets the road and you say, do I really trust God or not? So as we walk through here, Paul wants to say, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ 
because I'm a servant of God and I'm promoting God's saving purposes. He is the authority who tells me who I am, what I need, where I should be going. And he's the, uh, the advice that he's passing on to Titus. And he's setting up Titus to be the authorized representative of God's purposes. And if we as, God, as pastors here ever abrogate the teaching of God's word, we ever step aside from it, we have abrogated our position within the church. We should be taken out. We should be removed. Right? And we're going to get there at the end. If we're not giving you what God says that you are and what we should be doing, then we should be removed from our position. I don't care how relevant it is. I don't care how, how, how it makes us popular. I don't care how clever it might be presented. If it's not true to God, then it shouldn't be given. Right? So as the people of God, the question is, is that our authority in our individual lives and is that our authority as a church? And we want to strive to keep it there. Would you pray with me here? Now we're going to get prepared for our communi uh, communion now. Uh, and this is something we do every, uh, every month. Um, we, we practice what's called open communion here at Emmanuel, meaning that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he's the one that sets this table and he invites those who know him to come enjoy it with him at the table. So if you know Jesus Christ, please uh, join in with it. If you don't know Christ today, I, I would love to talk to you about Jesus, come follow him, but I would encourage you uh, not to participate today. This is not a table that there's something magic about the wine, uh, the cup, there's something magic about the wafer. Uh, matter of fact, everybody who's going to take that wafer today knows there's absolutely nothing magic about that wafer uh, that you take today, right? There's nothing magic about the elements. What we are is we're commemorating that by God's undeserved favor, we get to participate in what Christ did on the cross to forgive us our sins and to give us new life. And we're reminded of that. And we're also reminded of our call to follow him, of our real identity. It's a time of thanks, of celebration, of reflection. And so I would encourage you not to participate today, but I'd love to talk to you about following Jesus. Right? I'm going to pray and give you an opportunity to reflect before the Lord as we prepare uh, that will come to this table in a way that's fitting for the commemoration that it is. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercies to us today. Lord, I know uh, as we've talked today that, uh, Lord, we're all listening to many, many voices. Um, Lord, we've especially been a part of a culture with a lot of anger and rage and frustration, uh, a lot of fear and anxiety, Lord, uh, politically, um, Racially, Lord, uh, with the pandemic, Lord, all these different things, Lord, in the middle of all that, Lord, uh, overlying all those things is a God who's ruling and reigning, a God who has promised to fulfill every good promise that you have given and has made your down payment in the work of Jesus Christ already accomplished and the gift of the Spirit that has promised us, Lord, that what you have begun, you will fulfill. And Lord, so things really aren't out of control. And Lord, we don't have an excuse to forget who we are and to forget who you are and, and to become co-opted politically or co-opted in some other movement. Lord, please save us as your people from listening to the wrong authorities. Lord, help us to return to your scriptures over and over again to get clear on our identity and on our purpose. Lord, save us from being divided uh, by the reasons that people are being divided in our culture at large. Lord, please, Lord, across racial lines, help us to let the love of Christ predominate so that we're brothers and sisters who love and honor and appreciate and love each other well. Lord, please help us to cross uh, class lines, Lord, of the rich and poor and the middle class and uh, the upper class. Lord, please, Lord, help us not to be divided by our possessions. Lord, please, Lord, help us not be divided by our education. Lord, please, Lord, save us. Lord, give us uh, your resources by your spirit, Lord, to remember that you have made us your people, Lord, that we are yours, and you call us to live together as your family. And you've resources in Christ to do that. And so, Lord, help us to listen to you. I pray that, Lord, you'd help us to be faithful. Lord, I don't want to, this is not about guilting people or making us, uh, uh, Lord, say the same old things, uh, Lord, about needing to read our Bibles, but, Lord, save us from saying the same old things. Lord, help us to pick them up. Help us to read them. Lord, we need your help, Lord, as your people. With so many voices, Lord. And so, Lord, as we come today to the communion, 
But please, by the work of your spirit, would you open the eyes of our heart to be able to appreciate what you have done for us on the cross? Lord, that you came for rebels even while we were still sinners, you died for us. And Lord, you have given us life and life to the full. Lord, please help us. Lord, cleanse our hearts, turn our hearts toward you. And uh, Lord, we give you thanks. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. I want to invite you, you'll see on, on the two tables on each side, uh, there's an all-in-one container. And so if you get a small group of maybe three or four and you want to send one representative to go get the cups, it'd be easier to do that than to have everybody go. But you need one cup per person who's going to be taking the communion. So you want to get those as David plays. All right, if you have your cups, we uh, traditionally read from Paul's first uh, letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, we're reminded of the character of the communion, um, largely because the Corinthians were doing it so badly, and the Corinthians were making a mockery of what Jesus had died to create among his people. And it was meant to be, uh, as they come together, a celebration of the fact of their common bonds in Christ. As a matter of fact, earlier in chapter 10, Paul would describe you come to all eat of one loaf, meaning we've all believed in Jesus Christ. The reason why we're sharing this table is because we all have believed in him to save us and we're trusting in him and walking with him. He is our savior. He's Rhonda's savior. He's Melissa's savior. He's Paul's savior. He's Susan's savior, right? He's Josh's savior, right? He has given himself to us. And so we've all partaken of the one loaf and we're all drinking from the same cup. It's his death. It's his resurrection that gives us everything that we long for. And by virtue of that, we're all united, Paul would say, into one body. And so we're so connected that there's more real, lasting bonds between me and everyone in this room who believes in Jesus than there is between me and any of my closest blood relatives who reject Jesus. Because we are one in him. And so we come to celebrate that oneness. And so what was happening at the church of Corinth is that their communion celebrations were full of division and strife and one-upmanship. And this is one of the things by the call of Christ. This is calling us back to our common bonds in Christ, that we all need to accept one another, love one another, honor one another, bear one another's burdens. Right? This is the call for that. It's also a common reminder that Christ is the source of everything that we need, everything. He's the one who provides for us everything I need for life eternal, and for everyday life. He is my authority, my guide. He's not only my savior, he's my Lord. So it reminds us of those things. So as we come here, it's always God's grace to give us a moment to draw us back into the story to remind us of who we are and what God has done and what we're up to. And it's always also his grace to pull us away from sin. When we've lost our identity, we've forgotten who we are and what we're supposed to be. So Paul calls them to examine themselves before they get here. Not because he's trying to beat up on the Corinthians, because he's trying to call them back into the life that Christ has given them. Repentance is always God's mercy to say, I love you too much to let you go in that way. Turn around. Turn around. Come back. So I'm going to give a moment just to quiet. And if there's anything, and I pray often as David prayed, Lord, 
Try me. Search me. See if there's any wicked way within me, Lord, and lead me in the way of everlasting righteousness, Lord. Try me. Search me. So I'm going to give you a moment. David's going to play just to, to be with the Lord. Let him search your heart. If there's something there, just confess it to him. The great thing is God says if you confess it, if you own up to it, because you need to own up to it for your sake, and you turn to me, I'll forgive you. Don't worry about that and welcome you back. But he wants to do that for you today. So let's do that. Just a moment of quiet. Pray to the Lord.